Hello, viewer, and welcome to Spotlight here on Hope TV, where you look and live. And here on Hope TV, here on Spotlight, we always do our very best to bring to you stories and experiences and persons uh, who are influencing our community in the direction of light. And we have been having a series uh, brought to us a courtesy of Bible Society of Kenya on trauma healing. Very insightful uh, sessions. And thank you all for your feedback. Uh, thank you for uh, following this series of programs. And today we have a session on trauma healing and specifically on how to support a person who's gone through rape. How do we support a person who's gone through rape? And we are happy again to be joined by uh, two trauma facilitators. Uh, one is Reverend uh, Jeremiah Kinyanjui, who has been with us uh, here several uh, episodes now, and we are happy to have you again. And we also, again, uniquely uh, want to appreciate a our, 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 our new addition to this uh, team of uh, trauma healing facilitators. It's her first time, and her name is Wanja Ndongo. Now, Wanja Ndongo, welcome to Spotlight. Thank you so much. Now, the unique thing about Wanja Ndongo is that uh, she herself has gone through a rape ordeal, and she'll be sharing with us about how it happened and the effect of that uh, later on in this program. Again, do engage us uh, on triple two three two. That's our text message line. And again, let's hear you on our social media platforms uh, just telling us about what you think and what you feel about uh, the, the thoughts and inspirations that are shared here uh, in this episode of Spotlight. And it's just right for us to begin with you, uh, Reverend Jeremiah. Uh, and uh, because you encounter so many uh, situations, um, and, 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 and maybe you can just maybe describe for us what qualifies or what, 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 what does rape mean or what's the definition, a description of, of rape? I see. Thank you so much, Reverend. Again, it's a joy and a pleasure to be back here to continue creating awareness and uh, letting our people know that indeed there is light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, yes, there is hope and there is healing mm. despite the different traumatizing experiences that we have gone through. And yes, today we want to narrow down on how we can help someone who has gone through rape. You have asked me a good question on what is our understanding of rape. Mm. Indeed, uh, many people can define rape in many, many ways. But the simplest way I would say how we can define rape is, uh, is when a person forces themselves on someone sexually mm -hmm. without their consent, without someone else's consent. That is the simplest way probably we can define uh, rape. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently we are so familiar with the narrative that rape happens to women or to girls, which is, the, I would say, is very common. Mm -hmm. uh, but did you know, Rev, and our viewers, that rape also happened to men mm. and boys equally? And therefore, tonight, we are not only talking about the female gender. We're also talking about the male gender who have also gone through this painful, very painful mm. ordeal. Mm. And uh, in addition to that, um, rape can happen in many ways. Um, uh, do I say maybe uh, uh, in, in different occasions, so to speak? And uh, it's important for our viewers to understand that rape is rooted in the desire of someone mm -hmm. wanted, wanting to have power over someone. Mm -hmm. I know many of us really would like to relate it to lust or maybe to someone desiring for sex, but it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. Rape borders someone who wants to have power over someone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rape. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's got a description there. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that sometimes 
sounds strange, uh, Reverend, is to hear that, that rape also happens in marriage. Yeah. Can you speak mm -hmm. to that? True. Remember how we have just defined mm -hmm. rape. Mm -hmm. If there is no consent, you know, two adults consenting, that this is what we want to do. The moment there is sexual contact that lacks consent, then that qualifies mm -hmm. to be rape, mm -hmm. including in the confines mm -hmm. of marriage. Mm -hmm. If the two partners, as much as they are married, husband and wife, but uh, there is no consent, mm -hmm. then that qualifies that to be rape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, very, very sensitive discussion sure. because we know that mm -hmm. there are viewers who are um, watching us right now and they have gone through this ordeal. Mm -hmm. uh, and our prayer is that as they participate in this program, that there will be healing for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we also appreciate very much Wanjan Dongo for you. you being here, mm -hmm. having gone through uh, an ordeal of rape. And mm -hmm. you'll tell us more about that mm -hmm. in the second half. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe you can, uh, for this instance, just tell us some of the effects mm -hmm. um, uh, that come to a person mm -hmm. when they have gone through a rape experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I can say, Reverend, is that um, the major effect of going through rape for starters is guilt. Mm -hmm. You walk with a lot of guilt. We, you walk with a lot of shame. You walk with a, with a lot of anger. You have too much bitterness. And you have bitterness towards, um, you know, for, for a woman, you have bitterness towards men. And I know for men, you know, they also have bitterness towards men because, you know, get, they get mm -hmm. raped by men. Um, yeah, but um, there's that sense of um, low self-esteem. You don't look at yourself the same way anymore. Um, you, you just feel like something ugly that is just walking on the streets of mm. the earth, you know, mm -hmm. because um, you did not want it to happen, but it did, it did happen. So um, to a very large extent, it really, really makes you walk in a lot of shame, mm. in a lot of guilt, a lot of bitterness, a lot of anger. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. A whole lot of things. Mm. And combined together, they just make you feel you don't even deserve to be in this world. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people go through depression. They even commit suicide. Mm -hmm. I've known people who've committed suicide because of the same. Mm -hmm. I've also known people who have resorted, say, for example, women, because they were raped and they have so much anger towards men, they turn out to be lesbians. Mm -hmm. And we'll point fingers at them because, you know, they have turned out, they don't want this gender because this gender had them. Mm. So they want to be with the gender that they are comfortable with. Mm. Men, the same way, they will, they will turn out to be gay. I mean, because they were probably sodomized, you know, because that's rape, basically. Mm, mm. Yeah, so there are so many things. Uh, a lot of other people resort to masturbation mm -hmm. because they would rather not be with anybody whatsoever. Mm. They would rather just satisfy themselves. And yeah, that's, those are a lot of things that go on with mm. rape. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot. A that's whole lot. A lot. It's a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. And to think that you yourself have, you know, you have gone through it mm -hmm. uh, and you're here to tell your story. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's, that, that would be something that's very interesting and we'd want to hear more mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as we go on with this program. Yes. And now, now there is uh, something about when one finds themselves or one reports mm -hmm. that they have been raped, mm -hmm. uh, there is always uh, a tendency to blame mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the victim, exactly. to yeah. blame the victim. Exactly. Uh, and people would ask you maybe, mm. where were you, mm -hmm. you know, mm. why were you there, mm -hmm. and uh, how did you entice the person, and, exactly. you know, mm. it, it's all how are you, you dressed? how were you dressed mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk to that. Yeah, um, that is also something that I, when I started opening up about going through rape, um, I know these people who would ask me, like, why would you be going to the person's place in the first place? Mm. How are you dressed? Um, 
And my question usually is, when a person lives somebody like a child, a three-year-old child, mm -hmm. there is nothing in a three-year-old child that can actually make you want to have sex with them. Mm -hmm. It is just a mental thing, you know, that is in people's minds. So it is not how people dress, it's not how people act, it's, it, it's none of that. I mean, a woman can walk naked. And a, woman, and a man who does not care about um, raping someone will have no interest. They will not even look at her toys. It is all here in the mind. And, you know, it, it's something that, you know, you will always wonder, why does someone want to rape some, uh, someone? And that is something I was actually talking mm -hmm. to him about. And mm -hmm. he explained it very well. It's just it's a mental issue. Mm. It's a mental issue. You rape someone because of the desire to have control. Mm. Even if you're raping a young boy, is the desire to have control. Even if you're raping a little child, is the desire to have control. Mm -hmm. Even if you're raping um, um, a woman, mm. whatever age, it's the need to have control over them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it gives you... I guess some level of satisfaction. Mm. I mean, you will never understand, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you, you bring a, a, very, a, a very graphic image when you talk about, for instance, a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure that, uh, uh, Reverend, in the course of your time, you've also encountered children who've gone through rape. Mm -hmm. uh, and just maybe you can describe the kind of trauma uh, that uh, such children go through? True, mm -hmm. true, Reverend. We have encountered such and helped them to come to terms with that kind of a painful, mm -hmm. very painful experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I have seen in a, a majority of children is, number one, the, the lack of words they can use mm -hmm. to describe their experience. Mm -hmm. So most of them will adopt behaviors. For example, there are those who may refrain from eating. Others may refrain uh, from like uh, sleeping in a healthy way. And others will have nightmares. They will wake up screaming in the night and uh, shaking, sweating. And there are those now who may resort to truancy. They, especially if this experience is somehow connected with their going to school or probably is connected with someone at school, that those who may totally lose interest in going to school, mm -hmm. and of course that comes with the lack of concentration. Mm -hmm. uh, you find that the performance, because obviously this child is at school. Mm -hmm. So another thing we observe is that the performance the academic performance of this child get adversely affected. They start performing very poorly because of the obvious reason. They have lost interest. They have lost concentration. Mm. They are not there. Mm. And there are those who will withdraw totally. They will, they will withdraw. They don't want to talk. And we know it is the nature of children to want to go out and play. But these children, they kind of lose that and they want to just by, be by themselves, and they don't want anything to do with people. Mm. And of course, that comes with a lot of crying. And it is until they are able to be helped mm. by a competent uh, individual who is able to, to take them through the healing process, because it is indeed a process, mm. who is able to help them go through the healing process, help them you know, express their pain in a child-friendly manner, like in trauma healing, we say drawing or art, mm -hmm. expression, they, they, they draw uh, how they are feeling and what's going on in them. And then uh, we also use questions like uh, ask this child to compare themselves with something. Mm -hmm. And uh, by and by they get to open up mm -hmm. and uh, you find that sometimes the perpetrators will threaten this child. They will tell this child, if you ever tell anyone about this, I will mm. kill you. Mm. So the confidence is built over time mm. Mm. to an extent that they no longer fear mm. the, the perpetrator and they are able to disclose 
and share mm. exactly what they went through. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, sometimes you just don't need any more evidence to tell you that there's evil in the world. Sure. Mm -hmm that evil works in the world because yeah. when you think about mm. a rapist and a child uh, I mean that that's outright darkness yeah. it's mm. outright evil mm. uh, and uh, uh, Wanja you can tell us also mm. because of the dynamic of faith mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um, because you're there you're a Christian mm -hmm. um, and um, and this now happens to you mm -hmm. uh, how, I mean how how did it affect your faith uh, mm -hmm. in God okay it actually did. Um, I was born again at 13 years old. Mm -hmm. 13 years old, three months. I'll never forget because my dad wrote it in my notebook. Um, and I remember, you know, going to high school, being so born again. I can say so born again because, I mean, at high school when you're fasting for seven days, that's really being born again. But um, mm. yeah, then after that, um, joining um, Nairobi Pentecostal Church, this church, mm -hmm. Nairobi Pentecostal Church. And then after that, um, having the rape happen. Mm. And seeing how many girls were kicked out of school because they came in pregnant. Seeing how many boys wanted to be with me, but I was so committed you know, to being a born-again Christian that I was not giving it a chance mm. whatsoever. I was committed to the fact that, because my mom always, always said, any other sin is outside of the body, but the mm. sin of fornication is with mm. the body. Mm. So I never, that is something that really stayed with me. So I felt this, my body is the temple of the Holy mm. Spirit. So I would not ruin it for anything at all. So when the rape happened, and I knew how I was serving God, being in this Sidham church, mm -hmm. every, you know, for everything, missions and all that, mm. I got to a point, I was like, okay, God, if you really cared, mm. you'd have saved me from that. Mm. But now that you don't, bye-bye. Mm. We'll see you. Yeah. So you disconnected with Completely. faith and with God. And Completely. Wow, but completely. But here you are, mm -hmm. you know, those the same church yeah. many years later. I know. <laughs> uh, and would want to definitely hear that story. I and, know, I know. And, and, and we can also now uh, talk about how to help someone mm -hmm. uh, who has been raped. Mm -hmm. um, Reverend. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very important question. Mm -hmm. And I would say to some extent, it forms the backbone of our conversation tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the reason why we are seated here, the reason why Bible Society of Kenya had to partner with the Hope Media, mm -hmm. come to Spotlight, mm -hmm. is that we can let people know out there that, that help is available. Mm -hmm. So over to your question, how can we help this person who has gone through this painful ordeal? Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing that our people need to be aware of, please seek for medical care. Mm -hmm. Seek for medical care. Mm. Because many things can happen when someone is raped. We know of the diseases that exist in the days of our lives. Mm. And again, we thank God for the medical technology, the advancement to an extent that if someone has gone through rape and they are able to go to hospital immediately, I think before 72 hours, even if there were possibilities of a HIV infection, mm. they are saved from that. Mm. They, are, they will not get infected mm. because of the medical technology mm. which is there at the moment and we thank God for that. Mm. So all this I'm saying uh, that it is important for the person to seek for medical care, even if they are feeling okay after the experience. Mm. Maybe a feeling, maybe nothing much happened. Probably or what they can see, maybe it's a little blood and that's it. They, mm. they are not feeling any pain or anything, mm. but they need to go to the hospital. Mm. The next thing, which is very important, Reverend, and our viewers, is to seek for legal address. Mm. Many people, I believe, are aware that rape is a crime mm -hmm. in Kenya. Mm -hmm. The laws of Kenya are against it. And if anyone perpetrates, violates someone through rape, then the law comes after them. 
and therefore it's important to report to the police mm. to report this we have said first medical care medical attention then secondly let's not just bar it which is very common in our setting mm. our society mm. it happens every other day but it is buried but we are telling people today please don't hide it don't protect the perpetrator this the, the person who raped, the one who violates, if you protect them, they will do it to someone else. Mm -hmm. And this is why it is important to report mm. to the police. Then number three, Rev, which is also very important, mm -hmm. it's important for this person. After they have been taken care of at the hospital, they have reported to the authorities, let them look for someone who can listen to them. Mm -hmm someone who can help them debrief and even share their pain mm. someone who can sit down with them allow them to tell their story you know in trauma healing we use three questions what happened how did it make you feel what is the hardest part for you mm. they, they 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 are given chance to share how they are feeling mm. and they, how this where this experience has taken them. So that's what Wanja was talking about, mm -hmm. the shame, the guilt, the feeling of that and feeling worthless, the feeling of loss of self-esteem and uh, the stigmatization and all that can be addressed mm -hmm. at that point where they sit down with a competent trauma healer who will be able to help them come to terms and even experience healing. Uh, they, they, they go through the healing process mm. uh, after the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering about, because the ordeal is quite messy. Uh, and there's that process you've talked about. Um, but uh, Wanja, uh, maybe you can reflect on your experience and tell us how long mm in terms of years, did they take for you to say, now I feel better? I mean, our, I mean in terms of years, because the process, mm. is, the steps are clear. Mm. Uh, but how long did you, did you see uh, yourself take to reach a point where you can say, I feel maybe above this situation now or above the experience now? Uh, mm -hmm. Wow. Well. I would say it's a little complicated mm. because it took me 15 years. 15 years. 15 years. Mm -hmm. And it took me 15 years because I ended up jobless, carless, homeless, in the streets, mm. and in uh, rehab. And I remember this one lady who looked at me, and um, she had come to share her testimony. Because you know how they have the rehabs, Christian rehabs in the U.S., mm -hmm. where they, um, they just invite anybody who's gone through the experience. Mm -hmm. They just don't invite you because, you know, you have some degree of some sort. Mm -hmm. They want you to work with someone or listen to someone who has been through mm -hmm. what you have been through. And so this one lady came in one day, and um, I remember it was my seventh day into mm -hmm. the rehab and she looked at me and she said there's something that you need to heal mm. for the first time in 15 years i remembered the rape mm. for the first time in 15 years as in i had blocked it you know um some of these experiences you you block them you you don't want your mind to process mm. what has happened so you block it and so everything else that you do, it's, um, it's a manifestation mm. of the pain, you know, and the loss and the bitterness and the shame and the guilt and everything. So you numb, you numb that. And your mind actually has a way of blocking it. And it's not until I got to a place where someone was like, there's something that you need to forgive. Mm. For the first time, I remembered the rape. Mm -hmm. And so I had to start now the process of, you know, you know, forgiving mm. and, you know, just going through the emotions and everything mm. and then eventually learning how to forgive this person mm. because I eventually did. 
Yeah, 15 yeah. years is a, 15 years is a long, long time. time. It's, it's a, a long, long time. time. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that shows that the process mm -hmm. uh, is different for different people. Mm -hmm. um, as the journey of healing mm -hmm. and uh, you know, coming to terms with the ordeal is different from different people. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we'll hear more about that mm. uh, in the second part of our, our program tonight. Mm. But I also wanted yes. to share something about mm -hmm. um, sometime when I, I was sharing my story, there's a lady I met that was 70 years old, mm -hmm. childless, was raped at 16 years old mm. by a teacher. She got sephiris. She had her uterus removed. So at 70 years old, she still had not healed. Mm. So people can carry this thing mm. even to their deathbed. Wow. Yeah. If they don't talk about it mm -hmm. or they don't talk mm. about it. Yeah. yeah, that's heartbreaking. When yeah, you think very, about extremely. It. You know, and uh, let's talk about the rapist. Mm -hmm. um, the rapist because, I mean, the, can the rapist get help? Sure. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that is very important mm. for us not to leave out. Mm. Because of what we had said earlier on, that we would love to live in a society free of such painful experiences, mm. traumatizing mm. and uh, heartbreaking. Uh, but it happens. And therefore, for it to stop, we need to address the people, the ones who perpetrate. Mm. And this is why, Rev, it's important for us to talk about the rapist, mm. the one who violates, the perpetrator. And then how can we help them? Number one, they need to, to, to be helped to realize their mistake, to realize the pain that they have caused someone. And they need also to take, to, 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 to ask for forgiveness, first from God, mm. then from the person whom they have violated. Mm. They really need to ask for forgiveness. Mm. And number three, the rapist need to face the consequences. Mm. Mm. Because the law has it that if one violates someone else in this way, then they have to face the consequences. The, the consequences. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the perpetrator needs to face the consequences mm -hmm. of their actions, of their behavior, mm -hmm. even as they are helped as well to repent and also experience God's forgiveness mm -hmm. for themselves. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's... Yeah. Uh, it's uh... It's, it's difficult to put the rapist and God in the same sentence. Uh -huh. uh, and especially when you're not putting God as punishing, uh -huh. mm. you're putting God there as forgiving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's difficult. But uh, viewer, we are talking about helping someone who has been raped. And we are talking to Reverend Jeremiah Kinyanjui. We are also talking to Wanjan Dongo, who herself uh, has gone through a rape ordeal. And again, keep engaging us. Keep sending your messages on uh, 22232. Uh, keep engaging us on the uh, social media platforms. We want to hear what uh, you have to say. And when we come back, I uh, will be hearing the, uh, the story uh, of Wanjan Dongo and how, how it happened and how she struggled through it. Uh, to the level where she's sitting here, uh, again now telling her story for your sake. Uh, stay with us. This is Spotlight uh, here on Hope TV. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Thousands of people throng cities every single day looking for opportunities to make their lives better. They are employees, business owners, or just opportunity seekers desiring to have a breakthrough in their lives. Join me, DM Tanki, as we take this journey 
from the perspective of different successful entrepreneurs and corporate employees on Occupy Today every Sunday from 8 p.m. exclusively on Hope TV, Look and Live. Coming up this September, CITAM Springboard Convention 2022 with fresh anointing to radiate God's glory as we reach out to the lost. Mark and save these dates from the 20th to the 24th September 2022 at CITAM Valley Road. The convention is themed till the whole world hears and will definitely revive and uplift your faith. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Get ready for the Springboard Convention 2022. You don't want to miss it. Hope TV is where you look and live with an excellent selection of the best Christian programming consisting of local and international content of inspirational stories, talk shows, Bible commentary, youth, health shows, children entertainment, contemporary gospel music, extended times of worship, live broadcast, news, movies, drama, Christian ministry programs, and so much more. Hope TV is another quality service from Christ is the Answer Ministries with over 45% of authentic and credible local content every week. Hope TV is a sister station to Hope FM, Kenya's leading Christian radio station with footprints across the country. Tune in to Hope TV, where you look and live. Trees are important to us. They give us shade. They reduce the impact of stormwater runoff. They reduce the effects of drought. Forest is facing quite a number of challenges. Situated in the middle of a concrete jungle is Nairobi's largest indigenous urban forest. It is the biggest indigenous forest uh, within a city in Kenya. We are getting people coming to do the illegal dumping in the forest. Uh, we also have uh, some uh, opportunistic criminals uh, who once they commit crime, they run into the forest uh, to hide. Join us on Thursday, 4th August 2022 as we bring you special coverage on the plight of trees, Gong Road Forest, only on Hope TV Newswatch, where you look and live. Classics every Thursday at 11 a.m. Viewer, welcome back. Uh, this is Spotlight on Hope TV, where you look and live, and we are talking about helping someone who has been raped. And uh, also on this uh, edition, we have somebody here that is uh, uh, Wanjandongo, who actually has been raped and is sharing her experience, her reflections, her journey. And she's actually written a book uh, about that uh, through the belly of the whale. What a title. Through the belly of the whale by Wanjan Dungu, who herself is sharing uh, her story here. And again, do engage us on Triple Two Three Two and also our social media platforms just to uh, hear your reflections uh, as you listen to this story. Now, Wanja, you're here now and um, telling your story. Yes. Uh, and even written it down for the world to read. Yes. And, uh, and it took 15 years for you to 
even maybe more, you know, for you to get here. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't mind, uh, you can maybe tell us what happened, mm -hmm. um, how the rape happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I share very openly about how my rape happened. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, um, I was 22 years old, um, a virgin girl, and we, you know how we have groups, groups of friends. So I had gone to visit one of my friends who had lost a father. Sometimes I like to say his name was Jeff. Mm -hmm. There is no offense. Um, and so um, I went to see Jeff and I was taking to him a card um, for sympathy, a sympathy card. Um, I had no interest in him because as a born-again Christian, the last thing you want to think about is, you know, going to have sex with a man. So at the moment when I went to his, um, um, the hostels, mm -hmm. yeah, he was living at the hostels and I was living right next um, high-rise estate at the time it was. I don't know what it is now. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to see him and then he requested that I go in. Um, I didn't think that you'd go in into the men's hostel. So for me, it was a little strange, but I, then I didn't think, I didn't mm -hmm. process that, mm -hmm. not that quickly. Yeah, but then when I went into his, you know, he told me to go into his room and everything, that is when the rape happened. Mm -hmm. And it happened in no less than a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, something that my mind blocked. And then after that, um, I know he blocked my mouth, took my, I was wearing um, trousers, I remember very well, mm. and he took them down and he, he raped me in no, in no time. Mm. But I went back into my room, there was no conversation, we did not talk at all, and I just went back to my room and um, I was staying with a cousin at the time, and I just shut myself down and I cried mm -hmm. and cried and cried for hours, address. And then with time, you know, I started feeling funny emotions. Mm -hmm. Like I want to eat a samosa or something like that. And then that's when I was like, hold on a minute. You could be pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, obviously, I was a young girl who was getting her periods constantly. So I didn't get my period. So I, I realized I'm actually pregnant. Mm. So I talked to a friend of mine because I was like, I can't tell my parents this. They are, you know, church people. I cannot embarrass them. And I was like, nah, no, 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 no. Just, no. just before you tell us uh, mm. what it is that you did mm. when you realized that mm. you were pregnant mm -hmm. out of this rape, mm. uh, let's go back to the, the moment when uh, you were raped and mm. went away. Mm -hmm. uh, wh what did you, what were you feeling? You cried, but I was what were numb. your feelings? What I was your numb. Feelings? Mm -hmm. I was numb. Mm -hmm. I remember even when I went and slept in the bed and cried, I was totally numb. Mm. And then it's something like I wanted to just block. Mm. Because, um, okay. When you've never had sexual intimacy before, mm. you don't even realize there was penetration. Mm. And I say this very openly. You don't even realize there's penetration. It's, it's just that after, you know, a month or so, mm. I was like, okay, something must have happened. Mm. And that is when, you know, I realized I could mm. actually be pregnant. Mm -hmm. And... Eventually, I realized that I was because mm. I went got tested and I was. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and that is when I resorted to an abortion because I was like, the church knows me to be a Christian girl. Mm. My parents know me to be a Christian girl. The whole school knows me to be a Christian girl. Mm -hmm. How am I going to tell them I'm pregnant? And it's not because I chose mm. to do this. Mm -hmm. It's because someone did this, mm. you know forcefully yeah. on me. Mm. Yeah, so that was a very painful time for me. And 
clearly I lost my soul mm. completely. No, and it, it's it's uh, it's it's sad how mm. one unfortunate mm. event mm -hmm. or occurrence mm -hmm. leads you to a series now mm -hmm. of unfortunate decisions, mm -hmm. uh, starting with now, mm -hmm. you know, the abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, were there other decisions that you made that after that that you feel were directly caused by the rape ordeal? Mm -hmm. The very first one is I know that I hated men. Mm. I wanted to use men. I wanted to sleep with every man that I saw. Mm. And, and I made that like a decision mm -hmm. because I went into drinking and drinking very heavily. You know, let's just, just tell me that again. Mm. Um, because one would think that you would hate men. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it, the flip side is happening that now you want to sleep with every man. Exactly. Can you maybe... Because mm -hmm. it's like you want to abuse them. Mm. It, it, it's a feeling of you want to abuse them, but on the flip side, they ended up abusing me mm. in the long run. Mm -hmm. And because of the alcohol, because I got heavily into alcohol, heavily, as in it's, it's not even where you go slow, so you're drinking, and then, no. I just went right deep into it mm -hmm. because there was too much pain that I just needed to numb. Mm. And then this is pain that you're numbing that you do not want anybody to know. Mm -hmm. which, is, which is the other question, mm -hmm. whether there were people you would talk to. There is only one happened. person that I talked to, mm. the one who took me to do the abortion. Mm. I never told anybody else about that. Mm. Never. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here you are, um, you've been raped. And now you have um, had an abortion, and and then you uh, want to sleep with every man. Mm -hmm. Then you've gone into heavy drinking. Mm -hmm. um, where is wh what what was the the feeling in your in your spirit at that particular time as you did all this? What you can call unfortunate decisions. Uh, uh, to be honest, it's like I honestly did not care. Hmm. I didn't care. I didn't care if I died. I didn't care if I woke up the next day. I didn't care about anything. I just was in a nab state. Mm. And for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And thank God that he realized, you know what? This woman is going to die. For sure, for sure she will. And so there is a way that we were working with someone um, at some lawyer's office. And um, he went to the U.S. and he decided that he wanted to get some papers for me to get into the U.S. And I said, you know, I don't care. I mean, I really didn't care. Mm. Whether I go to the U.S. or I don't go to the U.S., mm. I didn't care. Nothing mattered at the point in time. Did you share this with your parents? Nope. Mm. No. Mm. Um, I didn't share about my rape with my mom mm. until the 15 years. Mm. And I felt pain for her mm. because... Mm. I just understood how she felt like for all this time. Um, uh, I'll go back a little bit. Mm. Um, so I left and then went to the U.S. And God opened for me a door to go to the U.S. Uh, without any problems whatsoever. But the devil is a liar because he connected me to some people who were drinking very heavily. Mm. So I joined in quickly. You're from Kenya, a drinking yes. uh, no team now in the USA, mm -hmm. you again yes. get into a drinking team. Yes, mm -hmm. I got into a team and, you know, we were working together, we were hanging out together, you know how Kenyans they do. Mm. And then obviously now um, I was at least able to go to school. Mm -hmm. I was at least able to even become a nurse. Mm -hmm. And, um, but it caught up. Mm -hmm. It catches up. Mm -hmm. You know, the drinking catches up. And then the pain, the pain. I mean, I remember that I would walk into a Kenyan club and they would all walk out. Mm -hmm. Because they knew if one just sees a man, she insults them. Mm. I used to call them all kinds of names because I just hated them. Mm. I just hated them. Passionately, I hated them. Mm. Yeah, so on the flip side... After that, you know, I started getting abused now by the same, um, you know, getting into 
um, obviously I wasn't married, but mm, I, was, mm. I was getting into domestic abuse, mm. which was really, really, really bad. Mm. Um, physical, emotional, social, I mean, just call it. Mm. And then um, at some point, I uh, got to a point where I even miscarried four children mm. um, in a very, very, very abusive um, relationship. Mm. And so um, I got into the rehab and that's where I was able to, um, I was able to kind of get myself back mm. together. I was scared. Because mm. you've been drinking for 15 years. You don't know how it feels to be sober. Mm. So I was really, really, really scared. And so when I got out, I stayed without a job. I don't have a car. I don't have a place to stay. Mm. And there was a relapse. Mm. And, and so it is like a, a process. Yeah. It's a process. You know, because mm. this is a life that you're used to. All right. You know. So getting out of it is usually like a Difficult, process. Yeah. And then having to reflect because it comes like, um, what can I call it? Mm -hmm. It's like a video in mm, your head. It's replaying. You know, it's replaying, mm. uh, you know, it's replaying like mm. everything mm. that you have done, mm -hmm. you know, in your, in your dark state. Mm -hmm. So that was very, it was a very painful, mm. yeah. Yeah, but anyway. Um, what I thank God for mm -hmm. is that my being able to open up, mm -hmm. uh, my coming back to Kenya was a demand on my dad mm -hmm. uh, because um, he requested that I come back to Kenya. And he said there was no longer any blessing for me in the U.S. So mm -hmm. I came back and two years later he passed on. Mm -hmm. So maybe God was speaking to him. Also at that time. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that um, it's good for you maybe to tell our viewers uh, you went to the rehab, mm -hmm. and uh, out of there, you, you began to mm -hmm. uh, to kind of come to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say are your most significant helps that you found that mm -hmm. started getting you, you know, getting getting you to a place where you can say, mm. "Now I'm on a healing journey." What are, what are, if you remember some? What you can say? This was significant. This was significant. This was significant. Mm -hmm. uh, I can mention a few friends mm -hmm. um, who stood with me and walked with me mm -hmm. and prayed with me. Mm. Um, and they didn't care. Mm. If I fell, they didn't care. And I'll mention one who is called Pastor Shiko. Mm -hmm. She's in Dallas. And um, she was very very kind and she still is mm -hmm. up to you today mm -hmm. and she still works with me and supports me mm -hmm. so I can say that there is I lost a lot of friends basically mm -hmm. because all my friends were on the other side so when I got back into church so um, I had to create new friendships mm -hmm. but I have realized that even after I've been back to Kenya I have had very good support mm -hmm. especially the pastors in Sitam. Mm. And I'll mention like Pastor Ken, mm -hmm. the Ongo. Mm -hmm. I can mention um, my Pastor Collins uh, in Nyeri. Mm -hmm. um, so they have been very, very, very supportive. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, and, and our viewers are interested in also knowing at what point did you say, now I am on the other side of this experience? At, at what point did you discover now I'm you know, I'm on the other side now. I'm not on, on the, on the leeward side. Now mm -hmm. I'm on the windward side. At yeah. what point? It's at the point where, after I had my four miscarriages, um, mm. I took a bottle. And I told God, if this bottle, it was a whole bottle, 750 mm -hmm. mLs. It's a bottle of? Had liquor. Okay. And I said, I'm going to finish this. If I'm still alive when I am done with this, mm -hmm. then I'll know for a fact that you want to, I want, you want me to be alive. Mm. If I die mm -hmm. after these 750 mLs, then I'll know that you, needed, you never needed me in this world. Mm. So that is when I went into 
It was nine months. Mm -hmm. Prayer, fasting, and nothing else. Mm. Prayer and fasting, prayer and fasting. And that's what God gave me a vision. Mm -hmm. And the vision was um, helping women. Mm. And um, because very many women had rejected me, um, God gave me the name Sisters Workshop, mm. where I started like um, um, the Sisters Workshop. Mm -hmm. I started that in Los Angeles. I did that in, um, in, Dallas, in Houston, mm -hmm. and I also did one in Phoenix. Mm. And after the three, I knew that is where God wanted okay. me. So he mm -hmm. gave me a vision mm. and a purpose to help women because women, we bring each other down mm. instead of lifting each, each other, other up. up. And it's, no, it's because we don't care to understand mm. why is this woman doing what she's doing. Mm. We are so quick to judge than, you know, All right. getting to know. Yeah. And we would want you to tell us also how you forgave um, the rapist. But before you do that, mm. I want to appreciate uh, some of the viewers who are uh, joining us and commenting about uh, this conversation tonight. Uh, I want to appreciate uh, Rachel Karari uh, and uh, also appreciate Joyce Gain. Uh, also appreciate uh, uh, the Decut office. Uh, that is, uh, 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 people are just watching that as well and uh, happy that God is faithful. He has healed you. Uh, appreciate also Paris Wagura. Uh, who is saying, Dear Sister Wanja, I am following this from Nyeri. Our God is faithful. He has healed you totally. We also have uh, Miriam uh, Dirango, who is saying, Nice discussion and good to see you, my friend. Uh, um, and uh, this is coming to also uh, Reverend Jeremiah. So it's, um, I, I, we, we appreciate your views and your comments and being part of this conversation. So uh, thank you for keeping it here at Spotlight. Now tell us um, how you overcame uh, or how you forgave your rapist? Um, when I was at the rehab, um, the lady that I have mentioned there, the moment she said there's something you need to forgive, mm. I knew it was the rapist that I needed to forgive. Mm. I was going to get out of everything that I was going through if I was still going to hold him hostage. But... It did not take one minute. Mm. It, it was a process. Like every time I would think about him, I'd be like, I wish I can find some people in Kenya who can actually kill him. Mm. You know? Because I'm thinking, he's probably moving on with his life. He's probably doing this and that. And I was like, I wish I could just... Mm. just mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, there was that. And then I, with time, as I prayed... As I learned about forgiveness, as I listened to, you know, tapes on forgiveness and videos on forgiveness, I was like, it's time to release him. Mm. And how I knew I had forgiven him, one day I was driving from Nyeri to Nairobi. And my, our common friend, the same one who took me for the abortion, mm. she tells me, um, I was at some funeral in Nyeri and I met our friend. Jeff, with mm. his wife and kids. And we continued with the, con with the conversation, mm. Mm. like with other things we were talking about. And when I got to where I was going and when I was remember, oh, she talked about him. Mm. Mm. And I was like, I think I have really forgiven that mm. guy because mm. I would have felt bad now that I've been told he has a wife and kids mm. and I don't have any wife, mm. a, a husband and children. Mm. So I would have thought that, oh, God, yeah. you're so unfaithful. Mm. But I didn't think about it. I actually, it didn't cross my mind. Okay. And that's how I knew. I think I have really forgiven. So I've not even tried to look mm. for him or anything. Mm. I have mm. for, forgiven and released him completely. All right. Wherever he is and however he is. Mm -hmm. And he, with his family. Yeah. Quite and I only, I have prayed for him constantly, mm. even for blessings quite upon his life. Yeah. yeah. Quite a story and an experience. Mm -hmm. and uh, Umasi could only have taken the hand of God for you to be where you are at. Mm -hmm. And now when you share your story, mm -hmm. um, many people getting um, healing also mm -hmm. from your story. That yes. your story has now become 
uh, not one of pain, but one of redemption. Yes. Can you talk about that? Um, I know that even when I wrote the book, uh, which was in 2011, 2013, I remember when I was revising it in 2013, I could not read it. And my publisher, he's called Pastor Bonface mm -hmm. in Ohio, and um, he wanted me to correct things. And I was like, Pastor Bonface, I can't read this book. Mm. Because every time I went through it, I cried and I cried and I cried. But the day that I was able to read the book and finish it without crying, mm -hmm. that's when I knew, oh, wow. Mm. Okay. Okay. I didn't think I would get here because I wrote it in the night. Mm. I used to write it at 4 a.m. in the morning when I would cry without anybody listening, you know. And, um, yeah, it took a lot of tears mm. to write the book. Mm -hmm. A lot of pain. A lot of pain. Mm. But I knew I needed to do that. Yeah, and it's now becoming a very helpful, mm -hmm. your story. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. A story of pain mm -hmm. is now becoming a... a a story that is helping others progress, yes, even uh, in their ordeals. And exactly. to see that what God has done for mm, you, mm -hmm. now it becomes a prayer for them. Yes. Do for me, mm -hmm. you know, in mm -hmm. my pain, mm. what you've done for, uh, for Wanja. Exactly. Um, and just before we uh, end the conversation, do you, would you say that there are some things that in your life right now mm -hmm. that you have not achieved um, and you relate them? directly to the repo deal? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Number one, I'll be 50 years in December. Mm -hmm. I am still single, no child, mm. no husband. Mm. I knew this would not have been the issue if that had not happened. But on the flip side, mm -hmm. I thank God that there are some souls that I have been saved mm. because of my life story. Mm. And probably if I remained the same person, I mean, God had to, has to trust you with some level of pain mm. for you to be able to change other people's lives. And I believe that God um, knew that I was capable of handling this because between 2008 in 2016, mm -hmm. I lost 14 friends to alcohol mm -hmm. and drugs. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there is a reason why God spared my life, mm -hmm. that I did not lose my life in that period of time and in those so many years, mm -hmm. because I would have, but I didn't. All right. Yeah. And so my life is purpose-driven. Mm -hmm. And I know there are some things that I don't have that I would love to to have, mm. but I also know that there are some lives that are still mm -hmm. living today because of my life. And even to, tonight, as you tell this story, yes. uh, there's so many people who are watching yes. that are being healed and yes. inspired Ex by this story. Exactly. So, um, as you say, you could have lost a mm -hmm. number of things, mm -hmm. but you've also gained a lot uh, yes. in the process. Yes. And keep telling your story. Keep I telling will. your story, Absolutely. and we really appreciate also the Bible Society of Kenya for bringing us, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, bringing to us you, and you can share your story with our with our viewers, and mm -hmm. lots of uh, positive feedback mm -hmm. coming about this story. So the healing mm -hmm. of others continues, yeah. and uh, we will continue with this uh, program uh, next week as well. And we just want to ask uh, our Reverend to just tell us about what we'll be talking about in the next uh, program. Great. Mm -hmm. So the journey continues, and uh, we are so glad that our viewers have continued to follow us, and we believe that indeed light, they are, they are witnessing light in their own lives. And therefore, next Wednesday, we will still be here, and we will be talking about domestic abuse. And a very interesting, uh, uh, do I say, topic because it, it is confused with domestic violence. Mm, mm. <laughs> but next week we will be looking at it in broad terms and see, so what's the difference and why should we address issues to do with domestic, domestic abuse? All right. Yeah. Mm. Again, another insightful session that we look forward to. Mm. Uh, and Wanja, really, really thank you. 
Thank so you. much for being open Thank and you. sharing your story mm -hmm. for the sake of the healing of others. Uh, viewer, also, thank you for being part of this uh, Spotlight Edition and thank you for your participation. And just again, uh, we see that there's no wound that God is not able to heal. So whatever pain that you feel, in addition to all the support that you have to seek uh, to, find, uh, that, uh, that, to find healing, just have it on the front of your mind that there's no wound too deep for God to heal. This has been Spotlight. Thank you for watching.